good morning and a warm welcome to everybody in the room. I have the great privilege of welcoming to the NATO Engages stage Canada's Dream Team, led by Canada's Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, who... <laughs> who is joined by Foreign Minister Freeland and Defense Minister Sajjan. <laughs> Mr. Prime Minister, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Now, we know that Canada has participated in every NATO operation since the founding of the Alliance almost 70 years ago. I followed with interest your visit to Latvia yesterday where you announced that Canada would be contributing additional troops and also extending the stay of those troops in Latvia for another four years until 2023 as part of NATO's mission to deter potential Russian aggression. The success of NATO rests both on shared interests, but also very importantly on our belief in common values. And I'd love to ask you to start by sharing with all of us your view of why NATO is vital to Canada's security and why you see the alliance as relevant to our 21st century challenges. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Karen, and thank you for uh, uh, giving us this opportunity to, uh, to engage this morning. Um, <clears throat> I think we have to remember a little bit why and how NATO came into being. NATO exists and existed because the great democracies had uh, just uh, countered communism and fascism uh, and it remained as a, or was an ongoing existence of pushing back against communism. Uh, but it's about enhancing and protecting the democratic principles that we all uh, hold as our core values. And that is something that continues to be as relevant as it ever has been. Uh, how we uh, help burgeoning democracies like Latvia. I mean, as you mentioned, I was there yesterday, and it was extraordinary to see uh, how uh, one of the things we don't talk enough about NATO is what happens when diversity of voices from within NATO come together. I mean, the battle group that Canada is leading for Operation uh, Reassurance for the Enhanced Forward Presence uh, ha is the most diverse in terms of, uh, of nations. There's about seven or eight different nations coming together, and not just uh, you know, side by side, but integrated with each other. And the learning that we do and the, and the, and the opportunity uh, to uh, grow together and reinforce those shared values in a way that is tangible and real while uh, supporting the Baltic states uh, is an extraordinarily important thing beyond just the military combat capacities. Uh, it's about remembering that we stand together in very important ways. Uh, and as you say, we were glad to extend uh, our mission for another four years to continue with Canada's leadership on this. Uh, and that actually brings me to another announcement uh, that Canada is proud to be making. Uh, we are going to be uh, looking with great interest this afternoon as NATO announces uh, that we are uh, going to engage in Iraq as an alliance, uh, capacity building, uh, training, uh, that next step in the challenge in Iraq, which was first defeating Daesh, and now we have to rebuild that democracy and strengthen it. NATO is going to take a significant role in that, and Canada is going to commit uh, 250 troops, a number of helicopters, and we're actually offering to command that mission for the first year. Uh, this is something that we believe in deeply. And your question, Karen, was about you know, how does this matter for Canada's security? Well, Canada knows uh, that uh, a peaceful world, a more resilient world, a more democratic world is good for Canada and it's good for all of us. And that's why we believe so deeply in NATO. That's why we stand so strongly with the Transatlantic Alliance. And we'll continue to step up uh, everywhere we can. Uh, as you said, we've been in every mission, not because uh, of any other reason than we believe deeply in uh, the values that we're putting forward. And we know that NATO is as necessary now as it was in the height of the Cold War. It's as necessary now to promote uh, the peace, security, and strength of our true democracies and those democratic principles, which are 
under threat everywhere around the world, it seems. Uh, this is a moment for us to stand together and understand that the perspective uh, that we fight for and stand for uh, is essential today and tomorrow. Well, thank you so much for making news here in this tent with the announcement about Iraq. That's, that's really terrific news and, and for that inspiring endorsement of the alliance. And um, Minister Freeland, I noticed that last month you received Foreign Policy's Diplomat of the Year Award, so congratulations. And I read... That would be a surprise to my husband and children, <laughs> but... <laughs> no, it's wonderful. And I read with interest the speech you gave there. And you focused on a key challenge that we're facing, which the Prime Minister also just referenced. And I want to quote you. You talked about the weakening of the rules-based international order and the threat that resurgent authoritarian, authoritarianism poses to liberal democracy itself. And after the speech, you were talking with reporters and you said, I believe very strongly that it's important for those of us who believe in liberal democracy to strike back. As you know, there are concerns about rising a liberalism in NATO countries. And just to follow up on the Prime Minister's remarks, NATO is an alliance that's based on shared values. So if Canada is committed to the rules-based order, how does NATO fit into that frame? Well, Canada is, there's nothing conditional about it, Karen. Canada is 100% committed to the international rules-based order. And not just because it sounds good in a room like this, but because we need that international rules-based order to survive and thrive in a really big world. You know, Canada is um, a big country geographically. We're the 10th largest economy in the world. But there's only 36 million Canadians. And we understand very profoundly that that framework of a rules-based international order is essential for us. Um, on the point about liberal democracy, Karen, um, and the Prime Minister has already addressed it, I, I think it is important. It is important for those of us who believe in liberal democracy, and I hope that's everybody in this room, to be proud of that and you know to understand that yes you know populism nativism even authoritarianism they are resurgent in very many parts of the world even in countries that had seemed to be successful democracies some of them seem to be moving backwards and i think those of us who believe in liberal democracy have to talk about why are why we hold our values why our values work. And I think it is absolutely relevant to the NATO discussion. You know, for me, I was, I was thinking about it on the way here, and as the Prime Minister said, we were in Latvia. You know, in a way, the NATO discussion shouldn't happen principally in a room like this or even in a meeting of our leaders. NATO is not chiefly an alliance of heads of state. NATO is an alliance of all the citizens of all of our countries who are collectively pledged to support each other. NATO really has to start at home if it is going to be an alliance that has legitimacy moving forward. And, you know, NATO, these kinds of conversations should be the kinds of conversations that we have, and, and I do have them. We celebrated Canada Day uh, just over a week ago, and at the barbecue in my neighborhood, in my constituency, believe it or not, a lot of people were talking to me about NATO and the rules-based order. And, you know, the Prime Minister talked about how we've just come from Latvia, where we visited the Canadian women and men in uniform in Latvia serving in enhanced forward presence. And I have to tell you, like people, think tankers here, you'll remember a few years ago, the big question was, how does NATO remain relevant? Remember all those papers people wrote about that? How does it remain relevant in the 21st century? I can tell you, in Latvia, it is extremely clear to people the relevance of NATO. That is not an abstract philosophical question. And probably the best conversation I had was with a former comrade at arms of Harges who served with our Minister of Defense when he was serving in Afghanistan. And she's an amazing Canadian woman. Uh, she was just finishing a six-month 
rotation in Latvia. Uh, she, we talked about her family. She had a seven-year-old and a four-year-old. And that's hard, right? She's been away from her kids for six months. And I asked her how she explains to her kids what she's doing and why she has to be away for so long. And she said, I told my kids that there's a big bully who is threatening our friends. Russia is threatening our friends. And I explained to them that I tell them that in the schoolyard they have to stand up for their friends if their friends face a bully. And I said, that's what your mom is doing. Your mom is standing up for Canada's friends. And I think that's a beautiful explanation. And we have to make clear to real, regular people, not that any of us are androids, but to people who don't <laughs> spend their days thinking about NATO, why this really matters. But I do love this idea of NATO barbecues, right? If everyone in this room starts having barbecues where we talk about NATO, that could have a big public diplomacy <laughs> impact. But, uh, Minister Sajan, I, we've hit on some core principles of why NATO matters. But in all likelihood, this NATO summit will focus on burden sharing. And that's because the President of the United States, Donald Trump, has focused so particularly on the issue of progress that NATO member states who are not yet spending 2% of their GDP on defense, when will they get there? And it reportedly, though Canada is of course increasing its defense spending, it isn't at 2%, and reportedly Canada received a letter from President Trump that was quite sharply worded. Canada wasn't alone in that. Many other NATO countries received a similar letter where Canada was criticized for not spending enough on its own defense and warning that Americans are losing patience with Canada's failure to share NATO's collective security burden. And I would very much appreciate hearing your perspective on this subject. No, thank you, Karen. And uh, uh, first of all, I just want to give a, uh, a shout out to all our NATO troops who are doing tremendous work on our behalf of our countries ar around the world. And we were just able to uh, meet not only our Canadian Armed Forces members, but uh, many of the uh, uh, many nations who are taking part of uh, the battle group in Latvia and how how well they're working together. And it sends a tremendous message of interoperability and unity and of, de uh, of deterrence. And we are facing challenges ar ar um, around the world um, to our uh, threats to uh, a rules-based order, whether it's from a counterterrorism perspective, whether it's Daesh, the migrant crisis. And because of those challenges, NATO is also stepping up, and hence the reason why uh, many of our nations are, um, have done our assessments on what, how, do, how are we going to contribute. And, um, uh, and the Prime Minister gave me a very uh, strong mandate to conduct a very thorough defense policy review so that we can determine what is needed for Canada and how Canada is going to contribute. And there's a reason why our defense policy now is called strong at home, secure in North America, and engaged in the world. Because we also have to make sure that we um, uh, look after our, our citizens, our North American defense uh, with our very important ally, the US, uh, as part of our uh, very unique command of uh, the binational command, which is NORAD, uh, so that we're secure in North America, but also our engagement in the world. And, uh, and Canada will always uh, do its part. Uh, we've been part of every, uh, every mission. But to, to making sure that we have the right capability. So we went through a very thorough assessment, not only talking to experts but our allies, but more importantly, talking to Canadians. And it is very relevant to Canadians, the importance of NATO. And there's a very strong message from Canadians of Canada playing its part. But Canada also needs to play its part in a meaningful role. It can't be just a check in the box. Yeah. All of us coming together, as uh, Christia said, this is about uh, uh, countries uh, coming together, bringing our collective experience. And that's what we are doing. So when we talk about uh, um, uh, the enhanced force presence, this is about na nations that are coming together, but making sure we have the right capability to support one another. And in Canada's role uh, here, we are making a very significant contribution into our defense, uh, a 70% increase um, uh, in, in the next uh, 10 years, which is going to modernize all our three uh, services, uh, including our special forces, but more importantly, not only uh, the role so that they can play, it's making sure that our women and men in our forces 
can actually make that meaningful contribution. And we are seeing that. So whether it's, um, whether it's uh, in Europe, whether it's our uh, naval task force uh, that we have committed to, whether it's our air policing, but let's not forget some of the other challenges that we um, are facing uh, together and in particular very excited about the, the mission and how is it evolved. We have um, defeated Daesh on the ground in Iraq, but now this is about capacity building and training, making sure we have the right leadership and we will always offer up where Canada can contribute, hence one of the reasons why uh, this announcement is also is, is very important about sending a very strong message of unity um, because we do have challenges to face. So what I hear you saying is the input metric is important, but let's also look at the output and Absolutely. Canada's contribution across NATO's history and, and now this new contribution in Iraq is a very clear example of that. And I do now want to open it up to all of you. So please, I'll try to get in as many questions as I can, but we'll start right here. And please just introduce yourself and, yeah. I'm chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee of Latvia. So once again, thank you <clears throat> for what you've done. Uh, my question is not about NATO, but the European Union. Uh, would you agree that the EU is an equally important partner in the transatlantic relationship? And would you think PESCO or any other EU activities to promote greater cooperation on defense are a threat to NATO or to what Canada is doing, or is it a compliment? I think the European Union matters significantly. I mean, Canada has been very pleased over the past couple of years uh, to have concluded a landmark progressive trade deal with, uh, with the European Union uh, in CETA at a time where uh, trade deals aren't necessarily particularly popular around the world. We're actually signing stronger trade deals uh, with Europe. Uh, we did one with uh, Asia with the CPTPP. Uh, we're working on renegotiating NAFTA and, and, uh, and keeping our fingers crossed on that one, but we, we are actually moving in the right direction on that. Uh, but uh, Europe is a valuable and important partner, not just to Canada, but to the world. Uh, I think there's <clears throat> a lot of interesting conversations that the Europeans are uh, rightly having about uh, their responsibilities around defense through the European Union. I think our big concern is their not be uh, overlap with what NATO is doing. I think uh, a real clarity on uh, what NATO is and what the European Union can specifically do more of is, uh, is quite frankly, a welcome conversation. I think uh, there is really a time for uh, countries of, of similar values, approaches, and democratic principles uh, to look for all the different ways and levels that we can uh, work together well, because we know that there are a lot of uh, forces, some explicit, some, uh, some more subtle, that are trying to degrade or break up the kinds of alliances that have led to unparalleled peace and prosperity uh, around the world over the past you know, 70, uh, 70 or so years. And if anyone else wants to jump in, just signal to Let's me. Let's try uh, and get as many questions as yeah, we can. Yeah, and yes, please. Radmila Shikirinska, Defense Minister of Macedonia. Uh, I wanted just to ask an additional question following the comment about liberal democracy. I think that Macedonia is an example that uh, autocratic rulers can seem to be very uh, stable and strong, but that crisis is looming behind. And I think it's also an example that liberal democracy can fight back and it can create new hope for democracy, rule of law, media freedom, and also cohesion in a very diverse region and country. But I also think Macedonia is an example that uh, NATO honors its words and the decision that we expect today, uh, the offer of an invitation to join NATO, uh, is an example for other countries in the region and elsewhere. So I would like to hear your views about how the enlargement in NATO should continue and how some of the other countries that have voiced their concerns uh, can predict the future of, of NATO allies. And finally, let me thank Canada for its uh, steadfast support for our NATO membership. Thank you. Um, well, I think that's all really, really well said. Um, and I think we should all really congratulate Macedonia on the tremendous work you guys have been doing in a difficult neighborhood, in difficult circumstances. And I think the point also about the brittleness of authoritarian regimes is very, very well made. 
Um, I began my professional life as a journalist covering the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and actually, one of the stories that I wrote was covering the famous Chicken Kiev speech uh, in August of 1991. And a few weeks after that speech, the so that, and that was a speech about saying the Soviet Union needs to stay together, given in Kiev. And a few weeks later, the Soviet Union fell apart. So um, it, it's a very important point for us to bear in mind. Authoritarian regimes can seem so strong and so implacable, but they're also very, very brittle. Um, in terms of a path forward for membership, I think that's also really important. And one of the strengths of, I would say, NATO overall, but even more broadly, I would add the EU to that mix, and I would say the whole idea of the transatlantic alliance is this was about creating an international rules-based order with liberal democratic values that was not a closed club that was open to membership for people and countries aspiring to share those values. And I think that openness needs to be one of our core values as a group, and we need to be true to that value. Please, right here. Oh, thank you very much. My name is Iskandar Akalbaev, and I'm coming from Kazakhstan. I'm also part of the Atlantic Council Millennium Leadership Program. So my question is actually basic. So what is your uh, kind of prediction? How do you see the future development of NATO? And uh, I think sometimes we uh, do not speak about the, 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 one of the greatest assets of NATO is their global partnership around the world. And how do you view the, the global partnership of NATO in Asia specifically? Arjun, um, no, thank you, Prime Minister. Yeah, I think uh, it's very important. I was, when I was uh, just recently at the Shangri-La Dialogue, um, and talking about the challenges. At, um, again, uh, um, whether uh, we talk about NATO and some of the challenges that we work to, uh, and we face and we work together, um, but we collectively as nations also uh, are working together in dealing with uh, some of the challenges there. For example, I'll give you an example. So some of the work that's happening in, uh, uh, in, in the Middle East, especially in Iraq, when uh, dealing with Daesh, we have to be mindful of the displacement that, that, that occurs with some of the foreign fighters. So we are working together to making sure that uh, are we putting the right tools in place to be able to monitor some of this, to prevent um, uh, cells being created in other places, and especially in places like the Asia Pacific. So we're, we are doing our part. And I'll give you Canada's uh, approach to this. Uh, we, uh, in the past, haven't, haven't had a consistent engagement in the Asia Pacific, but now we do. We do have a, a consistent engagement. We do capacity building in the area with our partners as well. So this is not about when you see a challenge, everybody wanted to jump in. This is about looking at if there's a challenge, analyze it and look at which nation's experience can be best suited. And that's the approach that we're taking and, uh, and that's the approach that we're taking for Asia Pacific. Super. Thanks. Thank you. Christian Schmidt, uh, Member of Parliament, Germany. And this is, um, yeah, it's very, very impressive to hear your report about Latvia. And I think uh, this enhanced forward presence is indeed one of a very, very strong signal that uh, NATO wants to have a, uni a unique uh, zone of uh, common responsibility and security. My question is, um, uh, uh, knowing that this is a very strong symbol, a very strong symbol, but symbols are not the end of politics and the end of situations. Um, uh, we talked, uh, and you talked in Wales, about uh, the necessity to have some deployability um, in case uh, of uh, developments. Um, this we talk about infrastructure, but we talk as well about capabilities being uh, prepared uh, to be deployable in due time. Do you see that there should be is all work done nationally and in NATO level, or what you expect that there has to be more enhanced commitment? Yeah. Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I agree entirely. I mean, the symbolism of us standing together is extremely important, but that's ultimately not what it's about. Uh, before the advanced forward presence, uh, there was a real risk. Uh, that what happened in Crimea could happen somewhere else. Uh, and uh, the Baltic states would not be able to stand against uh, a Crimea-like event. 
The fact is now, with the enhanced forward presence, uh, that could not happen. Uh, we have actually demonstrated capacity and presence uh, in a tangible, concrete, real way that means that that is no longer uh, the risk that it was just a few years ago. And that's what we have to remember, that as much as it's nice to come around and talk about uh, values and principles, unless we're willing to step up and stand for them, uh, that doesn't really mean a whole lot in the face of authoritarianism or backsliding democracies or uh, the strong arm tactics that we're increasingly seeing uh, in different places around the world. That's where NATO actually really deeply matters. And yes, a lot of people talk about the 2%, but Karen, as you said, uh, one of the things we're trying to do as a government in, in over the past two and a half years is get away from the kinds of announcements that governments used to make, which is we're spending $20 million on this program, we're spending $100 million on that program, and thinking that that's all you have to do to announce. Announcing money put in, announcing inputs, isn't nearly as important as demonstrating outputs. And we're trying to shift uh, our government's approach around deliverology, around actually looking at metrics. No, we've created this many jobs, or these many children are out of poverty, 300,000 are out of poverty because of our Canada Child Benefit. So we're looking at the actual metrics. And when we talk about 2%, and Canada's very proud to be increasing by 70% over the next 10 years, uh, our investments in our military, um, we also don't just talk about the cost, we talk about the capability and we talk about the contributions. Well, in terms of capability, there's a 20% metric that Canada is up to about 35%. We are significantly investing, getting new fighter jets, getting new uh, surface combatants for our Navy, uh, investing significantly in our military in very real and tangible ways so we can continue to deploy around the world, uh, but also it comes to commitments, uh, an ability and a consistency in being there and staying stepping up regularly in tangible ways. Uh, this mission we're uh, taking on in Iraq, which is an extension of uh, what we've been doing within the coalition, uh, that's moving into that next phase of how do we help in governance, how do we build institutions and capacity in Iraq to make sure that it stands as a fledging democracy that becomes stronger and stronger. Those sorts of tangible elements are at the heart of what NATO stands for. I mean, you can you know, try and be a bean counter and, and look at exactly how much this and how much money that, but the fundamental question is, is what you're doing actually making a difference? Is it having a tangible deterrence or support or, or you know, positive standing impact in a real way in the folks standing around a barbecue, in the everyday lives of you know, Latvians, certainly, uh, all the other Baltic states, uh, you know, people around the world that are receiving the impacts of NATO don't just benefit from the security elements of it, but benefit from this story we are telling, that democracies matter, that our values, our principles matter, and we stand together Yes, embracing the differences and the different perspectives across our 29 members uh, in little ways, but on the big things, we remain committed to uh, protecting and supporting democratic values and principles around the world. More important now than ever before, and not just symbols. Thank you. Very powerful. <laughs> We have just about four minutes left, and there were lots and lots of hands. I'm just going to take the last two together and then and pair older generation and younger generation. So you, and then we're going to come to the front row. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Stefano Stefani, the Atlantic Council. Uh, my question, is, question uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, is a follow-up to what you just said. Canada has participated in every single uh, NATO operation or deployment. Uh, uh, do you think that uh, uh, Canada has um, carried more than its share of the burden, if not in expenses, in blood and treasure? And how do you explain it to your barbecue uh, people that uh, it was worth it, the price they paid, especially in blood? Mm -hmm. just, let's grab this real quick. Uh, thank you. Rick from Latvia, Member of Parliament. Um, Thank you, Prime Minister, for a very passionate answer about values. Uh, that, I mean, there's no doubt we share them. Uh, but I was thinking of one, another ingredient that 
you know, unites us all together. It's a common memory. And this is something that we see in Europe that divides member states. And also we can see it in the NATO that we lack common memory, the memory from 20th century and also the memory, the recent memory for the last two decades in 21st century. And that is something I would just love to hear how it would bring and shape, you know, the understanding. And understanding only comes when we have shared values and also the memory. Thank you. Um, thank you. Two, two great questions. Uh, first of all, has, has Canada done more than its share? No. Canada has done its share. We, we do what we feel is right, and we don't think about share. We don't think about, you know, who's, who's doing more, who's doing less. We will do what, what we can and what we feel is right. I mean, Canada stepped up uh, consistently in, in Europe in, the, in two world wars. Uh, we have a tradition of understanding that, you know, Canadians are lucky to be, uh, to be where we are geographically in the world, and that with that luck comes a responsibility uh, to reach out and do what we can to make the world a better place. And that's why, you know, there are, you know, millions of Canadians around the world and NGOs and organizations uh, very much engaged with the international community in trying to contribute, trying to shape uh, a better world because not just out of altruism but because we know very much that if we can help provide some answers to how to build more resilient societies, stable, peaceful democracies uh, in the 21st century, uh, then it's better for everyone. Uh, economically, but also in terms of uh, you know, tangible uh, uh, lives. We are proud of having stepped up on the trenches of World War I, the beaches of World War II, uh, and in, in international peacekeeping and NATO elements. It's a, a sense of, of you know, who we are as Canadians, and we will always look for more opportunities to do that, and we'll always look for how we can best help. We're not the, the biggest country, we don't have the deepest pockets, uh, but there are things that Canadians do as well, if not slightly better than uh, anyone else in the world, and we will always be ready to help shape and contribute that, because we know that sharing you know, our solutions and what we've done well uh, can often you know, help other people figure out, well, what will work for them? And that's, that sense of shared responsibility is something that Canada has deeply, perhaps because we draw people from everywhere around the world and continue to, uh, but also because we know that, that we, we have a responsibility to do what we can uh, to create a better world. And a big part of it, to flow into that, is understanding the mistakes and the challenges of the past. Uh, Canada has uh, just celebrated its 150th, uh, 150th birthday uh, last year, uh, but at the same time, because our country is uh, the one that has you know, figured out better than anyone else that diversity is a source of strength, not a source of, dif uh, of weakness, uh, that it's about resilience. We have learned from people who come to Canada everywhere around the world, whether it's uh, Afghan refugees, whether it's Syrian refugees recently, uh, or uh, whether it's some of the previous generations of people fleeing from uh, Uganda in the Idi Amin years, uh, the boat people from Vietnam, or, or uh, the wave of migrations we got in the uh, post-World War II years from Europe. You know, we understand tangibly how things could be worse and where things have been bad around the world. And being able to remember that or reflect on how we can do better, how we can create a society that, that is based around values and not identity, uh, based around principles and rights uh, and opportunity, real and fair chances for everyone to succeed. Those kinds of principles, I think, are going to be extraordinarily important in the 21st century. As we get flows of migrations, of people looking for better lives, people fleeing you know, resource depletion, environmental calamities and conflicts, we have to start thinking about how we create societies that look at different stories as opportunities to learn and grow within your societies rather than trying to keep uh, the challenges of the world outside of your borders. And that reflection on how to, how to be open and stronger because of that openness and resilience is, I think, uh, something that NATO and indeed our sort of collective uh, developed world is going to have to grapple with in a more and more real way and not just in an intellectual think tank way, uh, with all due respect to everyone in this room, uh, but in a tangible way, how do we make 
you know, ordinary folks who are going through living their lives, not thinking a lot about politics or international conflicts, but how do we get ordinary folks to understand that resilient, diverse communities is a better outcome, that being there to support your neighbor makes you better and, and creates more opportunities for you as well, that yes, being engaged on the far side of the world to rebuild a broken state uh, is actually in your best interest. And yes, we need to take care of you know, the, the, the poverty and the challenges we have at home, each of us. But we also have to look at what we do to alleviate stress, tensions, misery around the world. Because if we don't, the trend lines we'll be on as a world uh, will leave us all poorer poorer off uh, in every different way. So this sense of collective responsibility, we've figured out, NATO countries, a pretty good model of how to support citizens, how to create strong governance uh, with freedom, with security, with all those things. And it's under stress right now. It's under tension from people who are anxious about where uh, their, their paychecks are going to come from, where their kids' jobs are going to come from. And our responsibility is not to enhance or exaggerate or profit from those anxieties out there. Our responsibility is to allay those fears, to tell people, look, we have faced down massive challenges as a world in the past, and we did it by coming together and standing side by side for what we knew was right. We can again, and we need to again do that. Recognize that the rise of populism, of, of aggressive nationalism, of, 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 of polarization in our public discourse in Canada and elsewhere around the world needs to be responded to with strong, confident, positive, rational messages about how we can solve these challenges together. And there is no better example of that than the extraordinary success that NATO has had over the past almost 70 years and indeed will continue to have in a way that is more relevant today than it ever has been before. I think we actually don't need a coffee break because I think we got shots of inspiration from all three of you that will keep us going over the next two days. But I think the resolve and commitment that all three of you showed to the NATO alliance is what we're hoping will come out of the summit overall. But Mr. Prime Minister, the comment you made about we can articulate what our interests are and what our values are, but that only matters if we stand up to support and defend them, and that's really what we mean by NATO engages. And so I think that idea of standing up for things we believe in is also a really powerful one. I want to ask you to join me in thanking our Dream Team from Canada, but I also want to ask you to please stay seated and allow them to leave the room, because you, as you can imagine, they're on a very tight schedule. But please do join me in thanking the Prime Minister.